Okay, so let's look a little bit about Java, a, look, a little look at Java interop. Uh, because one of the great things, one of the other great things about Clojure is it sort of solves the library problem by adopting the library of Java. You know, all new languages have this problem in that, uh, well, depending on how they're implemented, if they're implemented on a C base, they're starting from nothing. They're writing their own runtimes, their own garbage collectors, their own evaluators, their own libraries, et cetera, et cetera, and there's a tremendous amount of wheel reinvention. So Clojure's approach is to say, uh, you know, these libraries are written, if you could leverage them, in an idiomatic way, uh, you would be done. Because for a lot of things, not everything, um, there's not a big syntactic benefit to one language or another. Closing a file, it always looks and smells a little bit like close file. The parens might be in a different place, there might be a dot, there might not, but it's just, it's just not that rich a thing. And many library things are like that. Uh, so, Clojure sort of has a hybrid approach. The first phase is use Java directly. You can use Java directly in Clojure, no wrappers. You don't have to write your own library. It shouldn't make you feel too dirty if you like Lisp, and I'll show you, you know, how, it, how that looks. Um, if you have a higher level abstraction, you want to make it look a little bit more like um, something you would do in Lisp, you can build on top of it if you need to. Uh, but when you see how Clojure both lets you access Java and how Clojure brings Java things into its world, uh, you'll see that you often don't need to do that. So, first thing, dot mathpy, dot, we saw was a special operator. And uh, it says we're going to treat the rest of this like it's Java. In particular, we're going to look at the second uh, thing in the list and look to see is that either a class or not. If it's a class, this is a static thing. We're either going to be accessing a static field or a static method. If it's not a class, this is an instance thing. So that first call is a static call, right? Math.py. And you say dot math.py. Uh, that happens to be an access to a variable. Yes, in this case, closure adds some parens because it does want to delimit things. It doesn't want any magic syntax. Uh, so versus a, a direct field access, they're going to be a pair of parens added. Uh, but for function calls, it's no more parens or dots uh, than Java. And we type that in, and that's what happens. Uh, I'm going to show you some neat things right away, because that's what's cool about Clojure. The first thing is somebody asked earlier about what about concatenated calls? Right? You can say in Java, this, dot, that, dot, that. And you could say that in Clojure, too, by saying, dot this whatever, and then surrounding that with dot the next thing whatever, right? And doing the list kind of thing with growing uh, shells of calls. Uh, but I think, I mean, I know <laughs> most Java programmers would not be happy uh, with that. But that's where macros come to play, because there, it was really easy for me to write a macro called dot dot. What it means is read this as if you put dots in between everything. So this is system.getproperties.getJava version key. And it returns that. And I can put as many things in that list as I want. Uh, that turns into the nested set of calls to the first thing. But you don't have to write that. You can write this. If you have other patterns that you like, you can write macros for those too. But this one comes in, uh, comes included, dot dot. So that's a, a system call. And an instance call, right? One's a, a static call and an instance call, right? Because get properties gives you a property object, the properties object, and that's uh, the method get. New. Do, yes. Uh, how do you dot dot is just a macro. There's no language thing. It's not in the compiler. It's not special syntax. It takes those forms and turns them into the first one. It t turns it into a nested set of the first thing. The first thing is the only primitive Java member access thing that exists in Clojure. In other words, that dot up front in the top is the only special operator. This is an ordinary macro called dot dot. It's not special. You say def macro. You saw me say def something. There's something called def macro where you write something that looks like a function, but it's designed to take forms and return forms. But I can't def 
describe Def Macro more detail than that tonight. Def Macro, it's, it's like a function definition, but its arguments will be the forms that are up here in its invocation. New does what you think. It allocates a new thing. There's also syntactic sugar to make that smaller. Notice you can scope your guys and you can do all that stuff. No more parens and whatever, and they print and they do whatever. Uh, but of course, no one would be satisfied with that because one of the nice things about Clojure is it lets you fix Java. So let's look at a very neat macro called do to. Right? How often had you say, have you had to say this thing dot that, this thing dot the other thing, this thing dot the other thing, this thing dot the other thing? I, pff, I hate that. So as soon as I'm in closure, I don't have to wait for Sun to give me width or some thing to make that go away. I made it go away. I wrote a macro called do to. What does it do? It does to this first thing, all these other things. We make a new J frame. Instead of saying that thing dot add, that thing dot pack, that thing dot shell, uh, we can just say this. Do to this first thing, all the other things. As if it was the first argument to all those other functions. If those functions don't otherwise have arguments, you don't need parents. The macro will put them in. Think about what you could do if you could do this in Java. You could, you could make abstractions for all those patterns that you can't get rid of. Automatically closing files and things like that. Exception handling patterns that you want to put in. Logging policies. You can encode them all in macros and they're going to be uniformly applied everywhere and when you need to fix them, you can fix them in one place as opposed to everywhere where you put them manually. Uh, this is a better way to write Java. Uh, so what happens when I say this? It turns into this. Uh, again, don't get too confused by these generated things, but I want to show them because it shows you how there's a program behind this. There's a way to say, generate a symbol for me that we haven't seen before and it ends up with a number on it. Let some identifier be that first thing. This is uh, a macro, right? The use of dot in a name is a macro. It's a macro for a new. So this is the same as saying new J frame. But let's write a much more declarative style. So let some identifier be a new J frame. Then do, because we want to do a bunch of steps. So this is the way you make a block of, of expressions for side effects, because these are all side effects, right? Adding something to the frame, packing it, and showing it. Um, so do these things. Again, if that's that first syntax. Dot the thing instance call. Dot the thing pack, dot the thing show. I didn't have to say dot the thing over and over and over again. Finally, return the thing. Uh, this is what you have to write in Java. This is what you have to write in Clojure, and it writes this for you. Uh, there's lots of other stuff like this. Uh, at, a, at a higher level, the integration with Java is very good. You know, I said before, closure strings are Java strings. The numbers are big N number. Uh, the collections all implement collection. The collection library in Java is particularly good. And one of the nice things about it is that they defined as optional all of the non-read-only functions of the collection interface. So Clojure implements the read-only part of the collection interface, which it can. It can implement the mutating operations of the collection interface because its data structures are immutable. But it does do that. So you want to take the Clojure vector and pass it to something that, you know, copy from or any of the Java functions that take collections, it'll do it. Also, all Clojure collections are uh, iterable. Uh, so they do that. I mean, they are because they're collections. Uh, but so you can use them there. Uh, those functions, when you say fun, whatever, that yields an object that implements callable and runnable. So you can pass them directly to um, the executor's framework, to swing callbacks, directly us usable uh, in Java. And by, by calls to Java that need objects that implement particular interfaces. There's much more of that, but you can just presume if I could make it work and the semantics were correct, I've done it so that you can, you can interoperate. Um, from another interoperability thing, like if you were hosting Clojure, or if you wanted to extend Clojure, like I've shown you maps and sets and some other things, most of them are written in Java. You might have some really cool data structure you want to implement Seek on. 
there's an interface for seek. It's called iSeq. If you implement that interface, seek and first and rest, and every function I showed you before and every other function in the closure library will work on your data structure. You implement a three function interface and you're done. You interoperate with closure. That's what it takes to add a data structure to closure. And you can do it. You don't need to ask me. Uh, similarly, there are interfaces for everything else. I persistent collection, I persistent list, I persistent map and everything else. Interfaces for everything. You can extend closure yourself. Uh, the other way, the sequence library already works on a lot of Java stuff with no work. For instance, that seek first rest and all those functions work on anything that's Java iterable, which is all the collections in Java. Uh, they work on strings directly, and they work on Java arrays of both objects and native types. So all of that library, you want to call partition on a hash map, you know, Java hash map, you know, or, or you know, uh, Java lists, or all those functions will work on Java stuff. Uh, you can implement and extend Java interfaces and classes in Clojure. Uh, Clojure does not really advocate treating Clojure like Java, or really the creation of classes with members and, and things like that. Clojure likes interfaces and emphasizes implementing interfaces. Uh, you can extend a concrete Java class mostly because there are unfortunately defined Java libraries that force you to do that. So I had to support it. As a design thing, I don't support it. Uh, but you can do it because you have to. I mean, everybody's seen. It's funny, you know, the guys who did Java Util Collections, they're awesome, right? And you look at like streams, all the concrete classes in there, no interfaces, it's terrible. So, you know, but you have to deal with that stuff and I accept that, so you can do that. Um, I've recently added primitive support where the speed is exactly the same as Java. Uh, leveraging hotspot uh, to get a dynamic uh, performance inlining that they do, I don't actually do it. In fact, Clojure does not emit bytecodes for, for instance, integer arithmetic. I don't do it. But I've created the ability to call a static method that does that, and Hotspot will dynamically inline that, and it's exactly the same as if my compiler wrote integer plus. Uh, and the speed is just as good, and the speed is stunning. Uh, in fact, it's faster than any list I can find with all the declarations in place. Uh, Hotspot is outstanding. Uh, so what does this look like? What's a bigger thing look like? Well, this is a... Uh, this is actually a Java example, right? The Celsius thingy. Anybody know this one? Uh, I think I had some. Oops. I think I had some stuff here. So, oh, I should show you this. So here, let's look at a. Let's make sure I've loaded some libraries. So some imports here. Now I have a Java GUI stuff. So this is that do to J frame, making a J frame. Oh, there it is, hello world. Uh, but one of the things that's cool about Clojure, so that's, I put that do to JFrame add label pack show inside a variable so I could talk to it some more. Uh, so that's it here, hello world, but I can call set size on it. All right? Boom. You doing this in Java today? I don't think so. So dynamically talking to your UI app and tweaking things and changing the layout manager and whatever. You can do that all in closure. Of course, this isn't quite legit, right? I shouldn't be calling set size outside the auth, uh, auth thread, right? So there's a utilities thing, utilities invoke and wait. Now look what I have to do to make this consumable by that interface. Does everybody know this? Does anybody do Swing programming? Swing has rules. The rules are you can't talk to UI stuff from arbitrary threads because Swing is not thread safe. So they have a thing that says, give me a runnable, and I'll go and run it in the aught thread where it's okay, then I'll return to you and I'll, I'll, I'll make you wait until I do it. And that's called invoke and wait. So because closure functions are runnable, I can call that just like this. Um, this pound sign here is just even shorter syntax for fun. But you can imagine this says fun. Uh, I can't really explain that right now, but it's just another 
macro-like thing. So then we can do that. And that's using invoke and wait and passing a runnable from Clojure. It's not that simple in Java, that's for sure. Uh, okay. So now we have our, oh, what do we have? The swing example. So what are we going to do? We're going to do some imports. That's what imports look like. Uh, notice how that's also shorter than the Java version of the same thing where you'd have to repeat import, 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 import. Uh, we're going to define a function. Def fun is sort of combines def and fun. So you don't have to do two separate steps. Def fun, we're going to define a function. Celsius takes some arguments. We're going to let a bunch of uh, local names be values. We're going to set up the frame, the field, and the button, and the label. Right? This is that new syntax. So these are all calls to you, right, with their arguments. Um, and then we're going to add an action listener to this button. Now, this is another macro. You notice this and that are connected. So we saw that was dot convert button action listener is the canonic form. This macro interpretation of dot allows you to put the method first, which list programmers prefer. So if you don't like that, you could say dot convert button and action listener. I don't do that. I don't dictate you do either. Both are supported. So this is a lispy way to do stuff, which is what are you doing goes first. To whom goes next. Uh, so add an action listener to the convert button. Now we see dynamic creation of uh, an instance of an interface, right? We have to implement action listener. So proxy is the thing that allows us to dynamically, on the fly, do an implementation of, uh, of an interface. So we're going to proxy action listener. Action listener takes no arguments to its constructor. If it did, it would go there. This could be a list of in interfaces and up oh, at most one class. So that you could extend a class here or implement interfaces. There's the name of our method, right? The name of the argument. No ceremony here. I don't have to declare the return type, the type of the arguments, whatever. And then I just put the code. Okay, which in this case is just going to do whatever the job is. I hope this is the correct code for Fahrenheit conversion. So that's a step. And you notice let can take multiple expressions. It's going to evaluate to the last one. But you can do things for side effects. This is a side effect, right? Setting an action listener is modifying. Convert button. Then we do the, the do to trick, where this would be all those lines of frame dot this frame dot that frame dot this frame dot that. Where we're going to take the frame, set its layout, and this the components, size it, and show it. Should we? Sure. So that code is here. Let's see if I can get that. So. Uh, I already did this import, so I could do this other hello world thing. So I'm just putting my cursor on the Celsius, and I'm pushing the key that says evaluate this. That compiled the function Celsius, and that's what that tells you there. Because now the Celsius function exists. And this is a call here. This is a call to Celsius. It takes no arguments. we we'll do that, and we get the Java sample Celsius converter. So that gives you a taste of what it's like to do Java programming uh, in Clojure. I find it a lot more fun than Java programming in Java. Uh, all right, and now, now you're going to get a very fast coverage of functional programming. So Clojure's dynamic. It embraces the JVM. We've seen that. It's Lisp, right? Uh, it supports functional programming and concurrency, and they sort of go together, although there's a lot of value in functional programming without the concurrency. I don't really think there's valid concurrency without the functional programming. Uh, so what do I mean by functional programming? I mean, in this case, mostly two things. I think the term functional programming is erroneously applied to some languages, including sometimes to Scala. as uh, just meaning having first-class functions, functions as values, closures, and functions you can pass to other functions, making high, or returning functions from functions. Uh, but, the, but real functional programming is about side effect-free functions and immutable data. It's about saying every function is 
is literally a function of its arguments that produces a new value, and nothing changes in the function. Nothing that's passed changes, and nothing in the outside world changes. Now, obviously, we can call closure, uh, we can call Java from closure and do all kinds of side effects. So what I'm talking about here is what closure provides, in addition to allowing you to make a mess in Java. Closure gives you the recipe for doing functional programming uh, correctly. Uh, so we mean immutable data and the first class functions we saw. That's what I just said. Yes, could you do this by convention? A little bit. One of the problems with the immutable data, as we'll see if I can talk extremely quickly, is uh, having data be immutable isn't, isn't enough. You need it to be, uh, you need the ability to create things that appear to be modifications efficiently. Like you could make immutable data by copying everything, right? I just will never change this. I'll make a full copy every time I need to make a change. That's not practical, and it's not going to perform well. So immutable data is trickier than you think. Uh, there are a couple of flavors of functional languages. There's some that are very strongly statically typed. They have very intricate type systems, in particular Haskell. Uh, they're not for everybody. Some people love it. I think if you're mathematically oriented and your programs are like calculations, there's a tremendous fit in a language like Haskell. If your program has to talk to a database and the screen and the web and all this other stuff, I don't know that that's as good a fit. I mean, people do web programming in Haskell, but I don't see it. In addition, I think there are expressivity problems to type systems until they become omniscient, which is not going to be anytime soon. Uh, then there's dynamic functional languages, which are actually very rare. Uh, I think Erlang you know, certainly led the way here, and Clojure is another example of a dynamic language that's functional. Uh, so now you're combining dynamic typing with immutability. Different pairing. Why do this? Okay. Because it makes your programs better, much better. Concurrency completely aside, I have completely changed over to functional style programming, even when I'm stuck in something like C Sharp or Java. Because your programs are better. You can look at them, you understand what they do. This function, it takes these things, it produces that. You don't have to look anywhere else to understand what's happening. And as you scale up, that property becomes incredibly valuable versus being in the method of some class that has a bunch of fields trying to figure out how you got there or how to get back there in order to test it. Uh, I think functional programming is essential for concurrency. How many people have read Java Concurrency in Practice? Fantastic book. Absolutely fantastic. How many times does he mention immutable in that book? Tons. The problem is it's hard to take that advice in Java because there are no immutable classes and there are no persistent immutable classes like I'll describe. So it's hard advice to follow. Uh, but it's certainly... I mean, he's not advocating functional programming, uh, but his advice about immutability works for functional programming. If your data is immutable, you don't have concurrency issues. They can't exist because you're not changing something that's being shared. Um, there are other benefits to functional programming that don't accrue to closure because closure is not purely functional because you can't prove something about closure. You can't prove it never calls Java. Some of the things you can do with Haskell, you can't do with closure. Uh, on the JVM, there's a couple of choices, but not very many. Cal would be one that's going to give you the Haskell-like experience. I don't know too much about it, except it's that kind of a language and it's on the JVM. Uh, Scala, I think, gets a lot of talk in this area, uh, but I'm not sure their immutability story is consistent enough to deliver uh, here. I'll, I'll go easy because I don't know. Uh, Clojure, however, um, is, is a functional language. All those data structures I showed you are immutable and persistent. So what does that mean? Well, again, if you had an immutable data structure or something you wanted to pretend was immutable, all you'd have to do is not ever change it. Uh, the trick comes from, well, you usually have to change it. Or you, at least you need to make a modified version of it. And what is the cost of making a modified version? Of course, if you could modify it from an efficiency standpoint, it's pretty easy. You know, just take what was there and put something else in place. That brings into play all the problems of how do you understand your program and a bunch of problems for concurrency. Uh, what it, so there's something called persistent data structures. And here the word persistence has nothing to do with databases. 
A lot of times people hear the word persistence, they think we're storing something on disk. That's not this notion of persistence. This notion of persistence is this. The collection is immutable. When you produce a new version of the collection, the old one is still available. And when you do that, all the operations, all the performance guarantees of the operations implied by that collection type are still true of the new version and the old version, right? Which means you want to add something to a vector, okay? Well, I promised you adding something to a vector was near constant time. You can't copy the whole vector and make that performance guarantee, right? Because copying the vector is linear time. So somehow behind the, under the hood, Closure has to have a way to produce a new version of the vector without modifying the old and without breaking the performance guarantees, which are, you know, the ones I said before, the lookup times for hash tables and insert and, and uh, access times. All those guarantees have to be maintained. So by implication, the new versions cannot be full copies, right? That's just logic. Uh, all the data structures I've shown you, all the data structures in Closure are persistent. They have these characteristics. They maintain their performance uh, characteristics across quote modifications. Uh, and they, they, they have some interesting implementations which I don't have time to talk about. Um, if you wanted to look up how I did it, you could look up array mapped hash trees uh, and Bagwell. And you can see the implementation underneath the hash map in particular and the vector. Uh, I also have a sorted map and that's just it's kind of a standard red, red black tree with log n access and look up characteristics. So how does this work? Well, the way it works is that the new version has to share some structure with the old version. Right? In order to not have a full copy, you have to share something with the last version. Uh, and that's called structural sharing, and that's how you do efficient copies. You don't really copy very much at all. You build a new little bit over here, and you have a point at the old bits. Uh, because everything is immutable and final, uh, there's no chance of interference. If I'm making a, a modification to X and you're making a modification to X and we end up sharing state with it, well, because it could never change, we can share state with it because we're never going to be corrupted by a change to the thing we're sharing. And so on and so on and so forth. Uh, that means they're thread safe. It means they're iteration safe. There's no concurrent <coughs> modification exceptions or any of that nonsense. Um, so how does that work? Well, in general, it works, and I can't describe the implementation of these things in less than two hours each. Uh, but in general, it works by path copying. These kinds of data structures under the hood are trees. And when you make a modification, what ends up happening is you had this tree, and, and this tree is a little slice of what the inside of a, a hash map, the closure hash map looks like. And when you want to add something, what ends up happening is I build one new path to the new thing, and I have all the nodes point to the rest of this tree. So I wanted to change this guy. And I copied the path here. This gives me a new group to my new data structure. Most of the structure which is shared. If it ends up, I no longer paid attention to the old version, what happens? The parts I'm not pointing to get GC. So it's not like we accrue infinite references to things and keep them around forever. The things we don't really use anymore get GC'd. So if I never held on to this old version, this, that, 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 and that would get GC'd. The rest wouldn't because the new one is still pointing to them. But if I did keep it around, the person accessing this one would be totally happy. They, nothing happened to their data structure. And so on and so forth. There's, you know, that's just a general idea. Are we okay so far? So all of the closure collections have those properties. If something is, if, if when you say you're making a copy of something, would you I'm not you making a copy. No, okay, you are. But right. if you want to delete something from the structure. Same kind of a thing. It's still a path copy, right? I'm going to end up with a pointer to a tree where I'm going to have to change the node not to have a new thing, but to have one fewer thing. Which means this would just be missing. And that would be a deletion. This last circle would be missing. That would be the operation to delete this. And if the original truly were to be large collective, which is no longer 
nothing's going to get garbage collected until it's all the references. Remember, these are all nodes, so that garbage collection is per node, not for the whole entity. Link lists are 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 easy um, because everything happens at the head, and you know that's it's actually the trivial canonic persistent data structure is the list link list. Uh, the uh, the other two, it ends up the vector and the the hash map are similar structurally. They're both hash array map trees. Um, it's just that in the case of the vector, I know what the keys are all the time. They're always the integer indexes. So it, it is a different implementation, but logically it's not different. Um, also, well, there's some other details, but uh, th these were hard data structures to write. These took me, you know, years of research and work. Uh, but the performance is, is good, and the benefits are unbelievable. Uh, being able to just freely give somebody something, and they can use it in any thread they want, and nothing bad could ever happen, and they can make incremental changes for minimal cost, just puts you in a completely different world in terms of the way you can look at designing systems. Uh, all right, so now we'll put that into context. I think even if you set concurrency aside, using those kinds of data structures and taking a functional approach to writing your programs is going to give you much, much better programs, much more reliable, much easier to test. Uh, and understand and maintain. Uh, but when you put concurrency in the loop, there's no longer any contest. Nothing compares to using this kind of a strategy in designing your program. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about concurrency. What do I mean when I say that? I mean interleaved execution, simultaneous, whether it's actually simultaneous or simulated simultaneous. The key thing is that operations will be interleaved some of some will happen, some, some of another will happen, and we need the program to see consistent data and to produce consistent data, no matter what the interleaving is. Uh, there are simple scenarios in which that's easy to achieve. As you get more data, as you get more sharing, uh, it becomes much more difficult. As you get into operations that involve more entities, again, the difficulty level increases. <laughs> Everybody here who's done multi-threaded programming knows about deadlocks, lock orders, and everything else. Uh, it is hard. Uh, there are other things that you can mean when you talk about concurrency, and particularly you can mean parallelism. Uh, I'm not talking about that here. Uh, it ends up closure does have some neat parallel stuff I just recently added that's built on the fork join, which is beautiful. Parallel map, reduce, all those functions I showed you before. You can get automatic parallel. They'll use every CPU in your machine. You still say map. Uh, sweet. Uh, OK, this is my favorite slide. I'm going to have this in every talk I do from now on. Uh, it is my opinion that object-oriented programming, as delivered by Java, et cetera, uh, is not a good default way to structure your program. It simply is not. And believe me, I'm not sitting from the outside saying that. Right? I was one of the first people to program in C++ and have worked in that language for lots of years and was expert in it. I've done tons of stuff in C Sharp and Java and I have had it. It is not right. Uh, and there are many reasons why. One is, it is spaghetti code. Encapsulation does not change that. Okay? Encapsulation just means I'm in charge of the spaghetti code. It does not change it from being spaghetti code, which is all the side effects, the inability to look at a function and understand what it means, or to look at a piece of data and understand how it got there. Um, it's hard to understand. It's hard to test. All of these testing frameworks, is that about an inherent problem of programming, or is it about a problem of the programming languages? I think, to a large extent, it's the latter. Right? All these mock objects, all these things you need to get back into the same place so you could try to execute a test uh, is, is all built around the fact that these languages are not really giving you a good default. Right? Object-oriented programming was born in simulation. You know what? It's pretty good for that. Then it was used by framework designers who had to provide interfaces to stateful things like the disk or the screen or sockets. Well, guess what? Object-oriented programming is pretty good for that, too, because there is actually really state that corresponds to these objects. Then they wrote these nice frameworks. Then they gave you a language that lets you do that. Then what does every application programmer do? 
They don't have to abstract the screen. That's in the library. They don't have to do the disk or the sockets. What are they doing? Information. Well, guess what? That isn't a good object at all. A person class or an account class, that's a ridiculous thing. Right? You can't change an account any more than you can change the day of the week. It is the day of the week. Tomorrow, that's another day. It's a different day. It's not this day plus a day. Or this day, you know, well, it is this day plus a day if you do it functionally. But it's not this day changed with a, an additional day. Uh, so, yeah, but, but it's, the, the whole language implies, here's your class, here are your fields. By default, they're not final, right? You're, you're set up to do the wrong thing. Uh, so it's hard to test, understand, and reason about. From a concurrency standpoint, it's a complete catastrophe. It's a disaster. It's unworkable. Right? Eventually, you will die with locks. You'll either die trying to make them work, trying to understand them, or just from the stress. Um, it's not going to work. So as a default architecture for a program, I think it's not very good. Uh, but doing the right thing, taking the advice of Gets and you know, making your stuff immutable, that's really hard because it's not idiomatic in Java. Right? It just simply isn't. Everything in the language is telling you to do something else. There are some things during the execution of the program that you are building up whatever the state is. Let me, let me keep going. I agree there is a need in real programs to have things appear to change. Yes. Absolutely. I, you know, and that's an area where I think Clojure you know, disagrees with Haskell. You know, where, where they're trying to say, well, you know, we really don't want to do that. And you know, if your program is fundamentally a calculation, I think you can get away with that. Most programs I've written are not calculations. I've written you know, broadcast automation systems that have to run 24 hours a day, and there's all kinds, of, all kinds of state, and all kinds of things that have to appear to have state. Uh, but there's a difference between appearing to have state and having state. And we're going to see what that is. So what are the two ways of doing this? One is the conventional way, right, which is the way you have to build a program in your traditional object-oriented language. You have references to objects, and those objects can change. You have direct reference to a mutable thing. Okay. What, is your what is your obligation when you're trying to make that concurrently safe? You have to lock, because right, you have to keep you from making these changes while you're trying to see something consistent, or while you're trying to make something consistent, because you're all changing the same thing, the same space. Uh, so you have to lock and you have to worry. And everything about it, at least in Java today, and languages like it, which is you know, every, everything, uh, is manual and by convention. There is no language support helping you do this correctly. Uh, so now, there are some lock-free data structures, but if you look at well, we're, I'm going to talk about transactional memory in a second. But there's, there are two different things. Locked-free data structures usually don't support composite operations. Um, but transactional memory does. Let me, let me keep going. Uh, so the conventional way is that. Everybody's looking at the same space, and that space you know, can get scribbled on by anybody else. And there's all this, well, wait, wait, I'm scribbling on the space. And you know, wait, I need to see it. Don't scribble on it. I'm trying to understand it. That's how your programs work today. Uh, it's crazy. Especially when there's multiple spaces, and now, well, I started to scribble on this already. I, I scribbled on this, and I need to scribble on that. What are you going to do? Crazy. So there's another way, and it, there is another way. Right? We don't have direct references to things that can change. We have indirect references to things that can't change. And what we can do is make those references refer to other things that can't change. And we can do that atomically. So. The, the other model that makes it appear that things are changing in your program is that. Uh, you have indirect references to immutable data structures that are persistent. I'll explain that in a second. And you have concurrency semantics for those references. In other words, you're going to say, the only thing I'm going to let you change is this box. The box is going to point to something that can't change. And you can change this box only by atomically making it point to something else that can't change. And uh, Clojure provides three kinds of boxes or references that all have concurrency semantics. In other words, they all have rules about when you can change what's in the box. And none of them require any manual locks for the 
for the programmer. So this is, the, this, is your, this is your program today, right? You've got a reference directly pointing at a data structure which has random who knows what in it. Because as soon as somebody else can have that same kind of a reference, they could be changing it. And the only way to turn those question marks into something concrete is to stop the world from touching that thing while you either touch it yourself or read it yourself. There's no other way. Okay? So ensuring a consistent object completely falls to the programmer. It's completely manual and by convention. And as you get more objects and more objects that need to be changed in a single logical unit of work, this fails. This is the closure way. Indirect references to immutable objects. So we have this box. It has the reference to a thing. The thing it refers to, that's a closure immutable persistent data structure. It ain't never going to change. So now, let's say I'm the user. I need to read it. I can look in this box. I get a reference to it. Am I worrying? No. Cannot change. If while I'm, I got this out of there, I'm looking at it. I'm reading it. If somebody left something to the box, do I care? No. I don't care. There's never an inconsistent object. Okay. So how do we fake change? Okay. Well, we, do, we, we change. We're going to do an edit quote unquote edit. So we know it's a persistent data structure. So I'm trying to do an edit. Right? I read this. I'm making a new version here. We know it's persistent so it shares some structure. These aren't really representations of structures. We know they're really trees. But I'm making a new thing. I'm replacing for that one with Ricky and Lucy. Everybody that's looking at that box is seeing the other thing. Then, atomically, we update which means we change the box from referring to the one thing to referring to the other thing. And if, if that change of the inside of the box is controlled with concurrency semantics, you're done. Wait. Well, my head hurts. Let's suppose I was No, 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 not at all. What you have a reference to in your program is the box. Yes. At any point in time you want to, you can say, give me what's in the box. Okay. And at that point, you get a reference to the thing. Okay. That, no addresses get swapped out from underneath you. But the contents of the box may change. So all you need is concurrency semantics for the box, and you have a working system that the program doesn't need to worry about. So closure has three kinds of boxes. I, I don't have enough time to really describe them all, but I'll just say generally what they are. There's a kind of box that allows you to isolate change within threads. In other words, I have my view of the world in my thread. You have your view of the world in your thread. You can't even see my view of the world. I can't see yours. In other words, we have a logical box called thread, but when I'm in my thread, I see a different contents of the box than when you're in your thread. You see your own contents of the box. The mapping there, logically, is thread local storage. Okay? So there are boxes that are implemented in terms of thread local storage. That's a concurrency semantic. It's a concurrency semantic that guarantees isolation within threads. Now let's take on the, the harder problem. The harder problem is we'd like multiple threads to see the same set of changes, to see changes that each other makes. It's more sharing. And there are two kinds of boxes in Clojure that do this. One are references, refs. I shouldn't, they're all references. The boxes are called references. There's a particular kind of box that's called a ref. A ref is transactional. Uh, the rules for refs are that they can't be changed except in a transaction. And what they allow is for shared, synchronized, coordinated changes between threads. I want to change these three boxes to be whatever. They will keep anybody else from doing the, changing those boxes until you're done. Or maybe they'll change them, and you'll have to try again. So that's transactional. The other thing it has is agents, where every individual box is completely asynchronous. You can request a change, and eventually that change will happen. Uh, but you can't see it until you go and ask for it later. And the order of those changes being made um, is non-deterministic, outside of your single thread. In other words, you send ABC, it will get ABC. If somebody else sends D and E, they can get interleaved. That's exactly the um, change semantics of actors, but the implementation is much different 
um, than Scala or Erlang actors, so I call them agents. Uh, you can't do synchronous changes that way, like I'm changing two things. Uh, so let's talk about the most powerful of closures uh, references, which are the transactional ones, which solve the hardest problem. And the hardest problem is I want to move something from here to there, and I want it to be either here or there, never in both places, and never in neither place. In order to do that, you, you really need to access two separate things. So that's a hard problem with locks because you have now lock acquisition order and things like that, or what locks cover which objects. And the way Clojure does it is with something called a software transactional memory. Uh, if you've ever used a database, it's really easy to understand. It's like a database. It's a transaction. You say, start a transaction, do some stuff. Right? And the promise of the STM is that either all those things will happen or none of those things will happen. In other words, you're going to see all the effects, you'll see none of the effects. Uh, so if you look at it from the ACID properties, it's atomic and it's isolated. There's no consistency because there's no like, constraints on the data. That's something I could add. There's no durability because we're in memory with this stuff. Uh, so every change made to REST within a transaction occurs, or none do. And uh, no uh, transaction sees the operations of any other transaction. So it's exactly like a database, except it's in memory. What's the result of that? Well, some transac and transactions are speculative. But what if we both try to change the same box? Well, only one of us is going to win. The other one's going to have to retry. And those retries are done automatically in an STM. Uh, so you're going to go back in. You may see, well, now I can't do what I wanted. Or I can do it. I just, I'm going to do it with new data, new information. Uh, what that means is that inside a transaction, you have to avoid side effects. I can't uh, enforce that. So if you print in a transaction, uh, you may see it happen multiple times if your transaction is getting retried. Uh, so don't print. Oh yeah, I mean a lot of the closure infrastructure is, I and mean, closure is, this, I think, pretty nice Java library. Uh, all the data structures are written in Java. The STM is in Java. You can use it all. I mean, when I was building it, I had to test it, and before I had closure of the language, I had closure of the library. Uh, so yeah, you can. Uh, well, it'll retry until it can't, and then there are sort of limits. There's retry limits and timeouts and things like that to govern. Give up. <laughs> no, it looks like a function call and it returns. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to show you that, show you that in a second. Yes? <laughs> Nested transactions get absorbed by parent transactions. They don't have independent commits, so it's not like true nested transactions. Uh, but the fact that they get absorbed means it absorbed means it is very composable. So if you wrote a unit of work which was um, a transfer from account to account, and then you needed a shuffling transfer, which you know transferred from A to B and B to C, uh, and that called transfer twice. If you put that in a transaction, all those transactions would be one transaction, and the whole set would either succeed or fail together. Um, the difference between doing this and doing programming, concurrent programming in Java with locks is night and day. It's just a completely different world because this is automatic. The language is going to do this for you. If you put your things in refs and your things are immutable, you can't do it wrong. And you can't forget. And you can't get your lock order wrong and you cannot deadlock. But the, the GMM, I suppose, is the uh, uh, GMM, GMM has a component of lock analysis. Yeah, that's called debugging your manual locks. I mean, there are tools for helping you do that. I'd rather not even go there. Not that I'm aware of, no. I mean, the, the lock analysis is a research problem still. Even with static information in a statically typed program, and with lots of declaration help, you still don't really know the order of operations because you have to track all the flow control in your program. So you don't need to go there at all with closure. These mechanisms are completely independent of that kind of stuff. Um, and if you look at the STM, you'll see some really hairy Java locking code. But I had to do it, and now you don't. 
Uh, so I'm going to just show off a little bit here, a, a little demo. I'm not going to have time to explain the code, but I'm going to tell you uh, what the program does. It's a, it's a simulation of an ant colony. Uh, the idea is that there's a world populated with food and ants, and the ants are foraging for food. They're trying to bring it back to their home. They're going to uh, drop pheromones on the way. Uh, as they're working, they're going to sense pheromones and try to you know, follow them. That helps them do path following or finding food or finding home. Uh, they're going to sense food and obviously try to acquire it, and they're going to sense home where they're going to drop stuff off. Uh, the trick here is that ants act independently in multiple real threads. This isn't green threads or pretend threads or round robin or tick every ant faking it. This is real. So you could do a simulation without doing this, but what this does show you is what if there were 50, or I, don't know, I forget how many ants I have, 50 threads trying to modify the same data space because that's what these ants are doing. They're walking around, they're looking at the same spaces, they're picking up food. I mean, somebody has to pick it up, somebody can't. Somebody can occupy that space and the other one can't. There's all kinds of collision problems. There's all kinds of multiple cell problems because what an ant does is it looks around itself to see is, is there stuff. So it may look at three cells. Well, those three cells may overlap a little bit with some cells that other ants are looking at. So there's overlapping, irregular, um, data usage patterns. This is a really, really hard concurrency problem, as opposed to like, we all know we're going to touch this and that, so we're all going to touch this and then that. That's an easy concurrency problem. This is a really hard concurrency problem. Uh, so the ants act independently. Just to make it harder, we'll model uh, pheromone evaporation, so the pheromones are evaporating <coughs> in parallel. And of course, we should have an animated GUI, and we should do it in less than 250 lines. Right? Uh, so this is, uh, this is the code. Um, again, I can't walk through all of this, uh, but I, I do want to show you uh, what a transaction looks like. Um, this, that's complicated. Uh, this uh, simulation uses both the agents and the STM, uh, but I'm just going to show you the STM. So we're going to look at turn here. Uh, and what turn needs to do is, is modify the place that the ant is, is at. And really all you need to do to have something be transactional is to put it in a do sync. You just say do sync and you do whatever work you want, manipulating refs. And this at sign is, is dereferencing a ref. Um, so this is actually going to take an, an ant in a transaction and change its, change its state. Of course, it doesn't really change, it just appears to have changed to anybody who looks in the same place. Uh, so that's all it takes. You say do sync, you do your work. Um, there are bigger transactions down below. Uh, take food would be a good one. So take food, you're potentially, uh, you're potentially fighting with other ants. This is an example of um, some code that's designed to be called in another transaction. So you can see I'm dereferencing, well maybe you don't see, but all these at signs are dereferencing a box. Get me the stuff that's in the box, right? And then these things, um, uh, this one decrements, this alter call actually changes the place to have a different amount of food in it. Uh, so that's going to be, need to be done in a transaction. But you notice I didn't say do sync. Right? So what should happen if I call this? And you do, you get an error. So that's what you want. You don't have to manually do enforcement. Closure does enforcement. If you tried to call this outside of a transaction, you would get an error. It happens to be the case that this gets called inside a bigger behave function, which does it and other things inside a transaction. So automatic enforcement. This is the kind of language level help you need that you're not getting um, from Java. So they move around, they take food. Um, I already showed off a little GUI code before, but you can see you know, this rendering and painting and doing uh, image drawing, you know, buffered images and all that stuff. It's really pretty straightforward. Uh, Java there. So we have loaded that. So here's our world. Home is this blue box. I'm not a graphics guy, so you have to pardon my, my primitive graphics. Uh, we'll create a set of ants and uh, we'll establish the food, so the food of the red dots. Um, and then we're going to send off 
um, behave actions to the ants, the ants are agents. So the ants use the agent system to act in parallel and they use the transaction system to coordinate modifications to the world. That's a really simplistic description. So we'll start off the ants, they all start at home and they start wandering around. The green is the pheromones that they're dropping. And then I'll start up another thread, which is the evaporation thread, which will cause that to evaporate, otherwise this whole thing will turn green. Uh, and we can go and look. Whoa, my REPL has 69 threads. So there's a whole bunch of ants. They all have their own thread. They're all interacting with the environment. Um, there's no way to see this because it's moving, but at no point will two ants occupy the same space, take the same food, place food in the same place. All of that works. And th there's no calls to lock or anything else. Is the CPU uh, No, because this is set up to be real time. In other words, if I let this run as fast as it can, it would, you wouldn't really get a good, like, the ants are moving effect. But it's taking more than 100% CPU, so you do know it's doing something, right? You see the 120, whatever. Uh, but there, are, there actually are some sleeps in there to, um, to pace this thing so that um, you, you get the sense of motion. Uh, but you know, this may not be the kind of program that you write, but what this implies for programs that do use multiple resources for multiple threads is enormous. Just saying do sync, putting your stuff in references, and saying do sync around your work and doing your work in any order you want and knowing nothing bad can happen to you is just a completely different world. Um, but it all goes together. This couldn't work if what was in those references wasn't a persistent data structure because you need the ability to do that in transaction modification, that speculative modification efficiently. If everybody that ran a transaction had to copy the data that they were gonna slam back in there, it would not scale. So the persistent data structures, it all goes together. Closure is, a, is of a single mind and it's designed to, you know, to get here. I mean, I think there are lots of value to the persistent data structures. Being able to use a map like a list in recursive things, which you couldn't do with a hash table in, in common list. Um, you can do that with maps. You can use it because they are structurally recursive. The maps and the vectors uh, is very neat. But this, I think, is almost impossible to do otherwise uh, and, know that, and know that it will work. I mean, you can think you checked all your lock orders and you, know, you wrote down on napkins what to do when, but the next guy gets in there and changes your code and who knows if the program still works. And that's what really happens in multi-threaded programs. Uh, what am I doing? So we'll let that go. Uh, so that's a pretty small program and, and there's, it's not cluttered with threading stuff. You start threads, you say, agent, go do this, and it's often another thread. Off a thread pool, you know, it uses all Java goodness under, underneath. There's a whole lot more to closure. I went pretty fast, and I have just scratched the surface. I haven't shown you all kinds of things. It has metadata. There are ways to write loops that are functional. Uh, it has destructuring, as somebody asked before. Um, it has list comprehensions, which you might know from either Haskell or Python. Uh, there's a whole set of uh, things for relational algebra, all functional, that allow you to do things like joins of these maps and sets of these maps. Um, there are multi-methods, which are like generic functions, but are even more general, that allow you to do things like polymorphism without type hierarchies. Basically saying, the function to call when you get these arguments is a function of the arguments, which is really what dispatch is, except it's always a function of the class of the first argument. That's just a very narrow subset of what real generic dispatch is, which is dispatch based upon some characteristic of the arguments. Find the function, then call it. Closure supports that. It supports parallelism, as I said before. I haven't shown you namespaces. There are functional zippers, XML support. Any questions? <laughs>